A community of over 62 million people. Una comunidad que representa más de 62 millones de personas. But more than a number. Pero también que representa más que un número. Inheritors of a language shared by 21 nations, but much more than just words. Doctors, engineers, CEOs, workers, scientists, teachers, and students. Whether known as Latino, Hispanic, La Raza, Chicano, or simply American, some are powerful, some feel invisible, some change the course of history. Others stride across a stage as big as the world. From culture to courtrooms, food to finance, from our battlefields to our imaginations, this is an American story. This is Generation Latin X. Hola y bienvenidos. We are so happy you could join us this evening. I'm Morgan Radford, and tonight we're dedicating a one-hour special program to focus on the Latino community right here in the United States. And listen, we're going to dive into what it means to be Latino, what the future holds for the community, and even really just how you define it. But before we start, we want to make one thing really, really clear. Even though this is a show about the Latino community, with conversations happening among Latino guests, politicians, newsmakers, and celebrities, we want to make it very clear that this show is for everyone. This is for all of us. This is for you. It's for anyone who has ever wondered about the difference between being Latino or Hispanic or even Latinx. This is for anyone who has Latino friends, neighbors, coworkers, teachers, or even just loved ones, because this, this is about America. This community is part of the fabric of our nation. And as you'll see, it's also about the future of what our country is becoming. Take a look. I'm Latina, I'm very proud to be. I'm half Puerto Rican, half Dominican. It's an ethnicity. Soy Latina, soy de Mexico. I'm Puerto Rican. An identity. I'm a proud Latina. Everything about being Latina is amazing. And a culture that has shaped the world. Bendiciones de mi madre. Here in the U.S., more than 62 million Hispanic Americans call the country home, now the largest minority in the nation. A group that drove more than half of America's population growth in the last decade. That's more than any other racial or ethnic group. With a combined purchasing power of nearly $2 trillion. So much economic might that if Latinos in America were their own country, they'd be the ninth largest economy in the world. And with an increasing political influence to match, Latinos are on track to be the largest racial or ethnic group in the electorate, making up one in 10 voters in the 2020 election alone. But what it means to be Hispanic or Latino and how it's counted is still a contentious issue. While often united by language and culture, Hispanic Americans have a varied identity. From Spain to El Salvador, Puerto Rico to Paraguay, from Cuba to the Dominican Republic and more, Latino identity is constantly changing, and that identity can break stereotypes in some pretty surprising ways. Four in five Latinos living here are U.S. citizens, and while 73% speak Spanish at home, most believe you do not need to speak Spanish to be considered Latino. And the states with the fastest rate of Hispanic population growth? North Dakota, South Dakota, and Vermont. We come to, to this country with a dream, and after a while you feel like you're part of the United States. Proving no matter how you define the community, Hispanic Americans are now a demographic, political, and economic force to be reckoned with. So here to discuss just how these numbers specifically impact the Latino identity is our panel of guests, each one of whom has explored this topic in depth in their own professional work. First off, we have NBC reporter Nicola Savedo as one of the writers here, and she also posted a new article really analyzing the Latino population growth here in the United States. We also have our MSNBC contributor, Paola Ramos, who is the author of Finding Latinx in Search of the Voices, Redefining Latino Identity. And finally, for this panel, 
we also have educator and writer Rosaline Lake Montero. And we want to thank all of you for joining me this evening. This is such an important conversation. And ladies, we've got a lot of topics to cover, but Nicole, I would like to begin with you. And really, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, right? Language. Language has traditionally been the thread that holds this community together. But that's not always the case, and it's certainly changing. So how is the Latino community's relationship with Spanish evolving? And do you think that it's even a prerequisite to culture at this point? Morgan, it's definitely not a prerequisite to identify yourself as Hispanic, to identify yourself as Latino. But the reality is that the ways, the panethic terms that exist to define our communities on a larger scale are really deeply connected to language. So for instance, more than 70% of the Latinos at least speak Spanish at home. But obviously the proficiency of the language varies whether you're maybe a third generation Latino in the United States or if you're someone that just came from Puerto Rico or any of the Latin American countries that you know predominantly speak Spanish. So in that sense, what we see is that as more Latinos continue to set roots in the United States, it is difficult to keep the language you know, as proficient and, and be bilingual. That's why we see a lot of people embrace Spanglish, for instance. But right. it is true that, that regardless, it's part of, we acknowledge it's part of our culture and we want to embrace it to the extent that we can. Porque a veces es una mezcla. At times, it's just, it's a mix of language, right? So, Paula, I'd that like to turn to you. That is real. <laughs> eh, ya tú sabes, nena. You already know, girl. <laughs> Paola, walk me through, though, what led us to this moment where fewer Latinos are speaking Spanish at home. And really, you know, give us the big picture, Paola. What does all of this mean? How does society change when Latinos change? Of course. I mean, I think when, when you look back and you look at what's happening now, I think the story of Latinos back then was a story of immigration. You know, and I think that story is now shifting to a story of power. And I think the difference isn't just in the numbers that you just told us, which are huge. You know, we're growing in these exponential ways. I think the difference that I see, and I think this panel shows it, is that younger Latinos are more able and more willing and have more of a privilege to sort of embrace our right lean into our voices, lean into our differences, we can do that in a way that the older generation of Latinos didn't. And I think when you look at what's happening outside of our windows, you see how we're creating this sort of cultural shift. No, we don't just speak Spanish. We can speak Spanish if we want to. Suddenly, among the millennial generation, Latinos are the most likely to identify as queer. Suddenly, in Black Lives Matter protests, it's not just Black folks that are protesting. Also, young Latinos are protesting because there's suddenly this acknowledgement that also in our community, there are Black Latinos. Paula, I am so happy you brought that up. And to be clear for our viewers, we're going to have a family conversation. The types of conversations we have at our dinner tables and at home. And we're going to bring that to our viewers a little bit later in the show, focusing on exactly that point you made, Paola. Eh, me está patitando el corazón. My heart is already raised because I'm so happy that you brought up the multiple identities that this community has. Señorita Leica, I would like to bring you in here because many Latinos are now straddling, as Paola mentioned, two, if not three worlds. In fact, they identify with many cultures and races and communities. So how are people balancing those other layers, those additional layers of their identity? And how are those identities shifting? Buenos dias. I am so happy to be here. I look like this because I'm teaching, but I want to share that I agree with both panelists. Language is power. We are the descendants of our parents who were, who are here from other countries, right? So what the, what the way I see it is identity is shifting in a way where, like, I am a first-generation Latina, Afro-Latina, college graduate, but I embrace my American culture so much because this was the only country that gave my father and us a place where we can actually achieve our dreams. And unlike Latin America, we in America, you are able to speak up. You are allowed to call people out. In Latin America, if you call somebody out in any country, you probably will go missing, and that's real talk. It's funny. I want to go back to something you said just a minute, because a minute ago, because when you said about the power of this country and our stars changing in this country, I remember something my father told me when I was younger. Okay. He looked at me and he said, Morgan, 
our story is only possible in this country. My grandfather, right. his, his parents, you know, met in Cuba, immigrated from Cuba here to the United States. And my grandfather worked for the railroads and he drove a garbage truck. And I was able to go to college and I was able to go to grad school. And that, my father was explaining to me, is a story that's possible in America. So Paula and Nicole, I'd like to, to come to you for this question. You know, there's a growing number of second and third generation Latinos. So how is their relationship to their own identity different from the first gen immigrant experience of their parents or even their grandparents? I mean, what is unique about the way they show up in the world? And are there any challenges associated with that? Nicole, Paula? There is definitely the younger the younger you are and uh, still identify with the Latino community the more you want to be able to embrace your American upbringing and your Latino roots. And sometimes navigating the two can be challenging, like you were saying, Morgan. So for instance, we spoke to Alfredo Corona, who is a Mexican-American young man from Georgia, and he still wants to identify <clears throat> as Chicano. And I think it's that's the challenge. The younger you are, you want to identify collectively within this group of communities, but also find space to express your own individuality as well. Uh, I have to tell you all, this conversation, this topic, it, it's so important. And I would love for everyone just to hold on because we don't want to let you all go anywhere. We will continue this conversation and more in just a moment. But, but first, right now, I really want to talk about a term that is at the center of the conversation about Latino identity. News Now anchor Savannah Sellers explains why the word Latinx is so controversial. I first adopted the term Latinx for myself about two years ago. Coming from the Dominican Republic to the United States, I was immediately associated with being Hispanic, being Latina, but I think those two terms are not as inclusive as the term Latinx. Carolyn Gonzalez is a student at Rutgers University, Newark, who identifies as Latinx. The term is meant to be inclusive of people of Latin American descent who don't self-identify as male or female, or who don't necessarily want to be identified by their gender. I personally believe that gender identity is so fluid, is ever-changing. I identify as a cisgender woman as of right now, but maybe two months from now, I may be referred to as she, they, and then later on, I may be referred to as they, them. So I think using Latin X instead of Latina, it opens those doors for me and other people to be who we are without having to suppress our gender identity. But not everyone thinks the term is for them, like Angel Velez, who's also a student at Rutgers University, Newark. I just choose to identify more with being Puerto Rican. I definitely believe people should choose to identify how they choose to identify. I personally have no problem with the term being used. It can encompass everyone, but it also can be up to the person's individual choice. And if they choose to just not identify with this, I mean, I also think that's perfectly fine. A recent Gallup poll says only 4% of Latino and Hispanic adults in America prefer the term Latinx. But according to that same poll, most of them, 57%, say it doesn't really matter which term is used to describe them. 23% prefer Hispanic and 15% prefer Latino. The term Latinx has been criticized for many reasons. First, because many of Latin American people speak other languages beyond Spanish. The term Latinx has been grounded on the Spanish language only but it has not been analyzed on how it's spoken in other languages, for example, in Portuguese. There started to be some pushback against Latinx, and that came because, I think, it was non-Latinos who were using that terminology of Latinx. Journalists and, you know, public figures, and, and that really hit some people um, uh, the wrong way. And Carolyn hopes people will respect how she wants to be identified. It's not our duty to enforce an identity on anyone. I think that's a very, very personal journey. It's up to you if you want to have a multidimensional identity or if you want to use one word. At the end of the day, is what you feel comfortable in, is what really describes you and your journey. So Latin X, let's talk about it. We are back with our panel now. Paola, I'd like to start with you. Who is using the term Latinx? Who is not using it? And really, how has the conversation around it evolved, even since you first heard it? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I think language, like history and like people evolve, you no? Know? And so the way that I see it is that this new word, which obviously is causing a lot of controversy, is simply a new iteration of how to refer to the over 60 million of us. You know, to, to me, at least, it is the most diverse way to encompass all of who we are, not just queer Latinx folks, but also after Latinos and indigenous Latinos, Latinos that speak English and Spanish that are from the Midwest and the South, liberals and conservatives. As it stands in the vocabulary, the way that I see it, there is no word that can sort of create that image. The words Hispanic, Latino, Latina are words that are full of history, they're full of biases, they're full of restrictions. And so Latinx at least is doing something great, which is it's, it's forcing us to talk about things that have typically been uncomfortable, posing the very simple question of who is part of the 60 million, right? And so the way that I see it is this controversy at least is forcing people to open their eyes and the way that I see the rejection is there is something about the image of that diverse image of Latinos, right? The image of me standing next to a Black person, next to a trans person. There's something about that image that a lot of Latinos don't want to see hmm. or don't want to acknowledge. And I think that is pushing a lot of the rejection. Now, that's interesting because another sort of uh, rejection, a common rejection I've heard in terms of the reasoning for why people don't like that term is because they say it creates even more labels and even more boundaries. So, Nicole, you know, you wrote about how less broad terms like Chicano, for example, are being used more across the country now. Do you think that we're going to see Latinos embrace even more specific labels as time goes on? And do you think there's any risk to having an increased number of labels? Absolutely. I mean, when you look at, for instance, the Pew Research Center, they have studied this. And even though 57% of people who would fall under the category of Hispanic or Latino say they don't have a preference with either term, if you put that against people's um, terms that encompass people's country of origin, they would prefer that. So identifying as Mexican, as Puerto Rican, as Chicano, like we mentioned earlier. So Again, it's going back to finding spaces to both live with the collective identity and the individual identity. I do not necessarily think that by people embracing more of their individual histories, um, it will become challenging for us. I just think we're still figuring out how, how to coexist with both identities, our collective one and our individual one. Pero, Senorita Lake, what does that evolution, what impact mm -hmm. does that evolution in vocabulary really have within the Latino community? And also, how does it impact the way that others view the Latino community? I mean, you're, you're working with kids every day. How are they grappling exactly. with these terms and understanding how they view themselves and how they express who they are? So I want to shout out my girl, Paola, because I definitely agree with you um, with the whole term Latinx. Pero lo que pasa es que I wrote it so I could get myself. Calle 13 says something very cool, and he says, Soy el desarrollo en carne viva, right? And that mm. literally is what Generation Z and us millennials are. We want inclusivity. We want to build wealth. We want to end poverty. So we are able to explore those terms even more. If you are a child uh, and you are from the inner city and you are Latino or Latinx, labels are so important, right? But like, if you're hungry in your stomach, if you're not getting the proper resources in your community, you're really like, okay, I'll identify as this or that, because that's real. If COVID did not show us anything, it showed us that our children need to be included and they need to be connected it by mm. representation, right? Mm. Representation matters. Before I let you go, you know, I can't help but think of the fact that in this country, we are at a time where things are so sensitive, right? People are afraid of, of asking questions sometimes because they're afraid they're going to get canceled if they ask the wrong question or they say the wrong thing. But what I think is so important in this moment is that we are creating a safe space for people to learn. And remember, this show, this special, this isn't just for Latinos. This is about Latinos, but it is for everyone. So in one mm -hmm. word, based on all of the terms we have described today, I'm going to ask each of you, if someone were referring to you, what term would you prefer they use? Nicole? Well, in the ideal world, Boricua. <laughs> Okay, y Paola? Latinx. Y Senorita Lake? I am an Afro Latinx 
woman in Washington, D.C. So I will use all of that. Nicola Acevedo, Paola Ramos, and Rosalind Lake Montero, thank you so much for joining us. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the challenges facing the Latino community from within. We're going to talk about colorism. We're going to talk about racism. And most of all, we are going to have a real conversation about some pretty tough topics. We have actor Las Alonso, who will be here with us, and you may know him from The Boys or Fast and Furious, but he's also a really vocal activist and has a lot to say about diverse representation. But first, throughout this program, we're gonna be bringing you the voices and the visions of Latinos living in the United States with views on everything from arts and the economy to politics and pride. Being Latina to me means representing my culture, um, most of all my Mexican culture from my family. My parents are from Jalisco, Mexico, so it's a big honor for me to represent here in L.A. because in L.A. there's so much um, Latinos and Mexicans, and it's beautiful, you know, sharing my traditions, my culture, um, the delicious food, the music, just everything. As, as someone that identifies as Latino, I think our community has a big responsibility at this point in time in continuing to show the world that despite the political instability that we see in many of our countries, we are resilient and we are talented people and we will continue to move forward. Um, we have seen major contributions by Latin artists to pop culture, contributions to business and science like Diana Trujillo's uh, work with NASA. Mi gente, welcome back to everyone here. We are celebrating Generation Latin X as we zero in on the elements of the American Latino community that really show its breadth and its diversity. So let's get right to the numbers. Analysis from the Pew Research Center finds 5% of the U.S. Black population in 2019 identified as Afro-Latino. So that's 2.4 million people, up a whopping 145% from 2000. Now, the same research broke the numbers down by age, and that data showed that 51% of the Afro-Latino population in the U.S. was under age 22. That's nearly a quarter of Afro-Latinos who are part of the millennial generation, so that's ages 23 to 38. All of that adds up to a whopping 75% of all Afro-Latinos who were under 38 years old that year. And as the population of Afro-Latinos rises, so does their prominence in popular media and in elected office. Not only becoming breakout stars in movies, music, and television, but also increasing political forces. So you can see that all reflected in the 2020 census data. Those are the real numbers. While the Latino population grew by nearly 2.5% in the past 10 years, the number of multiracial Americans skyrocketed by 276%. Updated census questions allow people to finally be more specific about their identities. There's also more of an openness today for Latinos to identify as more than one race. But while the population grows, we're still seeing instances of inequality, of colorism, of racism impacting Afro-Latinos. And I'm joined in this conversation by Afro-Cuban actor Las Alonso, who's working to highlight the issues of race and representation. Also, Diana Danelli de los Santos. She's best known as the actress and performer Amara la Negra. Her passion is promoting diversity to really inspire the younger generation. And we also have Laura Gomez, a UCLA professor and author of Inventing Latinos, a new story of American racism. I have to first thank you all for joining us to talk about a to topic that can be at times sensitive, can be at times tough, but is always necessary. So first off, Laz, I'd like to start with you. What do you think that people do not know or misunderstand about what it means to be Afro-Latino? Well, I think the first thing that people want to do is make you pick whether you are Black or whether you are Latino, as if it were a choice. Uh, I'm both. A la vez. A la misma vez. I am both. I was, my family immigrated to the U.S. from Cuba, so my ethnicity is Latino. But what is our race? We're black. In Cuba, you're black. You're not Afro-Latino, you're just black. O eres cubano That's y ya. It. Well, you're no, just Cuban. Cuano, pero, sabe, everybody has a race. Tenemos you know, tu eres blanco, tu eres negro, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so 
Uh, you can be both at the same time. And I think that the numbers that you showed earlier that showed how the younger generation, Generation Z, is identifying with their blackness and with their Afro-Latino-ness more than some of the older generation was is because in some ways they are also accepting that you can be both simultaneously without having to pick one or the other. Which is really a luxury that the younger, younger generation has that people before didn't have. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but when I first started taking the census, there wasn't even, those options didn't even yeah. exist. You had to pick one or the other. Check, right? are you black or are you Latin? You're sitting there, you're like, well, how, how am I supposed to do this? I've always picked both boxes. Did it count? Who exactly. knows? But I wasn't going to allow a piece of paper to make me mm -hmm. pick one or the other. It's interesting. Amara, I'd like to bring you in here because I want to ask about your relationship with colorism in your life and in your career because your stage name is Amara La Negra, the black woman. And it's a way for you to embrace your Latinidad and your blackness, como digamos a la vez, at the same time. So can you tell us why that was so important for you to lead with that? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Shout out to Laz. I love him so much. We've had um, so many panels in the past talking about this. And um, in my case, it was very important for me to make myself as vocal as possible about being Amara La Negra. In many occasions, they told me, well, why not just Amara? And I felt like saying La Negra and being proud of it was my way of representing my people, my way of being as loud and as vocal about my blackness, my melanin. And it makes me very proud when people call me La Negra. A lot of people consider it to be, oh, we don't want to seem racist, but not to me, because that's what I am, and I'm proud of being that, and, and um, that's what I do. You know, it's interesting, because race is more front and center, as Laza mentioned, with, with, with younger Latinos. I mean, so Laura, can you explain for us and our audience, first off, what colorism is? Because we're talking about it, but, but let's back up for a minute and really define it and explain how it plays into race, especially within the Latino community. Absolutely. Um, so I would like to actually say we first to understand colorism, we have to understand racism. Racism is typically something that we think of as a, a something between different groups. Right. And in, in terms of white supremacy it's whites over brown, over black, over Asian, over indigenous. But colorism is something that happens within each of those groups. So for example, in the African-American community, there is a lot of research that shows that light-skinned African-Americans, I'm not talking about Afro-Latinos, light-skinned African-Americans do better in salaries, in terms of their, their um, uh, jobs, in terms of the discrimination they face, et cetera. Similarly, within the Latino community, and I'm really glad that we're talking about this, we're now, I think, becoming much more willing to talk about anti-Afro-Latino and anti-Indigenous Latino racism within the Latino community. And so that, that is, a, in a nutshell, what colorism is. And I think it's very important to add in the Indigenous community here, because um, it's very important to keep our focus on Afro-Latinos also, but I want to make sure that we bring in the anti-Indigenous uh, color as well. And I think you raise an interesting point because, if I'm honest, I think all of us on this panel can say sometimes Latinos get to shy away from the conversation of racism because we can say, bueno, somos Latinos y ya, you know, there's no way we can be racist, but that racism happens, and that colorism happens. And I'm not even sure that the Latino community is as practiced in talking about those issues of race and of colorism. Laz, I want to come back to you because, especially in Miami, entre cubanos, in the Cuban-American community especially, there was a very intense conversation about Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter put up a post um, talking about the support that Black Americans have typically experienced in Cuba. And many felt like that really missed the mark. And you spoke out about it. And my question is, how do you balance that? Because you are a Black man. You went to a Black, historically Black college and university. Eres cubano. Did you get backlash for speaking out about that? And do you think we need to create a space where we can really promote racial identity and harmony without politicizing it? So I think that, first of all, that's an, a very, very good question because before I made the post, I prepared myself for a possible backlash. 
more than anything because I support uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter. And I think that there is a distinction between the movement and the organization. There, there's two different, there's, there's the organization and then there's the movement that you feel, that you believe that black lives should matter in every situation, specifically when it comes to police brutality. Um, when I made that post, for me, I looked at it like a teachable moment. For the last 65 years, the Cuban government has been lying to African Americans and positioning themselves as a civil rights government, as they have been, you know, the, the uh, utopia for black people on the island. And if you go to Cuba and if you visit the island, you're going to see that black people are disproportionately living in more poverty than some of their white counterparts. And that if you look at the Cuban government, it's made up of all white people, no black people. Where's the equality? You know, at one point, Cuba opened their doors for uh, Black Panthers to come in. If you don't like the U.S., come in. We're the safe haven for black people. But when they got to Cuba, they were not allowed to wear their afros. It was considered mm -hmm. counter-revolutionary, and they were not allowed to talk about their blackness to other black Cubans. But how about, I mean... Well, well let me finish. Yeah. Let me land. So, so there is a re-education that has to take place that the Cuban government has had a 65-year advantage and head start that slowly but surely people like myself and other people can say this is the reality in Cuba when it comes to blackness. It's not what they have been talking about for the last five years. It was more of a teachable moment that I took that opportunity to explain to them why their post was insensitive and tone deaf. Do you find, just briefly, because I want to bring Amara here, yes. do you find that those identities for you are ever at odds? Because while you're talking about having to educate black Americans on what it means to be Cuban hoy en día, now, do you ever find yourself having to educate fellow Cubans who also have experienced or expressed some racist sentiments at times? Yeah, I mean, of course. I think that it's, 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 you're, you're in between two, two races and two cultures. You know, because at the end of the day, when I left the house growing up my whole life, I was African-American, but at home, I was Cuban-American. Um, but more than anything, my, my mission is to, to educate, when it comes to Cuba specifically, to educate what's happening on the island. My, my mission is Cuban liberation. That's what I want to see happen. Patria y vida. Patria y vida. Amara, I want to bring you in here because eres Dominicana, you're Dominican, and right now at the Texas border in Del Rio, there are thousands of Haitian migrants who are being deported, and the images we've seen are hard. They're hard to watch. What do you right. say about the situation and to the people who do not understand what it is like coming from the island of Hispaniola and what this means? I mean, overall, to me, um, I think that we all have seen the images of what is currently happening with Haitians in the border right now. It's heartbreaking. And in a moment like this, we need to really talk about the importance of, to me, of what immigrants bring to this country. This country was made by immigrants. Um, and just how they have the same energy for Afghanistan and other countries, I feel that they should have the same energy for Haitian people at this moment. My mother, unfortunately, had to cross the Mexican border to get to the United States. And I feel very identified with what they're going through because I know that in this moment, they're not leaving their country because they want to leave. They're not leaving because they want to take over the United States. They're leaving because of poverty. This is just a terrible situation. And yes, you know, these are my fellow brothers and sisters because we are in the same island. You know, I am a proud Dominicana. They're Haitians and they're really going through it right now. We need help. We need to fix this. And the same way that people have all this money and all this energy and all this time to talk about face masks and any other situation, we should have the same energy for what's currently happening right now. Amara La Negra, Laura Gomez, thank you so much for joining us. And Las Alonso, please stick around with us because we are coming back to you in just a moment. Coming up from spending to voting, we are diving into the power the Latino community has at the polls and as business owners. Uh, mi nombre es Camilo, eh, soy de Ecuador. Uh, mi parte favorita de la comunidad de Ecuador en Queens es eh, cómo es la gente, cómo comparte y también cómo, cómo es su cultura aquí en, en New York. También un ejemplo es su comida, que eh, hay muchos carritos que se encuentran acá en Queens.
Welcome back to our NBC News Now special on being Latino in America. I'm Morgan Radford. The Latino community is quickly becoming one of the fastest growing parts of the American economy. And yet, that influence is often overlooked, something that experts say is simply a mistake. Meanwhile, many Latino businesses, once growing at a record pace, have been economically devastated during the pandemic. But now, there are new signs that they are bouncing back, now stronger than ever. After a crushing pandemic that cost the Latino community 32% of its businesses, there's new evidence that now Latino-run companies are not just surviving, but thriving. And Sandra Velasquez's pandemic-born brand Nopalera is one of them. I just felt like I didn't have a choice but to figure something out, you know, to like do something and like do it big. So Sandra created a line of soaps and botanicals based on the nopal, the Spanish word for a type of Mexican cactus. So is there actual cactus in this? Yes, all of these um, have actual cactus. Using a symbol of her culture as a selling point. What is distinct about your company? I overtly put our culture like into the brand. Like it's loud and proud on the packaging. It's the name is in Spanish. There's a brown woman on the front with like, you know, nopales coming out of her head. So I really did that on purpose so that when you saw the brand, you're like, oh, it looks like my mom. And like, I love that. And people really see themselves reflected on shelves. And why is that? Why was it so important for you to make sure that Latino identity was really central to your product? Well, to be honest with you, I feel like in this country, we it's so Eurocentric. You know, when you see all these products with French names and Italian names and they're expensive, people just like accept that. And I really wanted to fight this kind of stereotype that Latino products should be cheaper or should be in the bargain bin. I just feel like we have such a beautiful, rich culture and we are totally worthy of the same price tags and our community wants to purchase them. And she built all of this. So now we're up to about 200 independent boutiques nationwide. This product is in 200 stores across the country. Yes, yes. Starting from her home kitchen in Brooklyn. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. <laughs> in the middle of the pandemic, when the country's facing record unemployment, you are working not one, but two full-time jobs and being a single mother and starting your own company. Yes, and I think it's because I just felt like I had no choice but to create something for myself. Her story was once a common one. In the 10 years before the pandemic, Hispanic entrepreneurs grew by 34%, faster than any other demographic. Then the COVID crash came and Hispanic families made up nearly a quarter of initial job losses. Here, let me help you. A loss that hit home for Kayla Castaneda. After losing her job as a consultant at the start of the pandemic, she turned to her roots. We joke around and we say, when life gives you lemons, make aguas frescas. And co-founded Agua Bonita, a twist on traditional flavored water known as aguas frescas, and the work of her grandparents picking fruit in the California sun. This was a really important part of starting this business, was wanting to put our culture at the front and center in a modern way, in the same way that we are modern Hispanics, modern Latinas, you know, because that takes on a lot of different shapes for a lot of people. Sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's just your grandpa's agua fresca recipe. A recipe for success, both she and Velasquez hope will continue for their entire community. Is that in any way symbolic, given that you started this company in the middle of a global pandemic? A hundred percent. Like our byline is like resilience, resilience is bella, like resilience is beauty. And I just feel like that is just, we've always been here. We're always going to be here and we're always going to continue to grow no matter where you try to put us or throw us. And be resilient in the process. Yes. Resilience, no matter the odds. Talk about some incredible success stories. Money expert and business coach Janice Torres Rodriguez is with me now, and she's the host and creator of the podcast Yo Quiero Dinero. I have to thank you so much for being with us today, Janice, because look, when times got tough, as we just saw, those women returned to their culture and their upbringing. So is there a broader lesson here? I mean, it really struck me when Sandra said, look, people want to purchase this. So, so what about that resonates with customers? Is there a broader message, even for non-Latino companies, about seeing the purchasing power of this block reflected in the brands? 
Absolutely. I think there's so much of a desire to see yourself represented. And so that's exactly what we're seeing with these women. They are literally putting them their most authentic selves out there for you to buy. And that's what people want. People are tired of having one solution fits all type of approach when it comes to how businesses do business. We want to feel represented and we want to feel like you are talking to us. And when you say that, I mean, you know, you focus on helping your clients not only build successful businesses, but also financial independence. I mean, how can people get a leg up in this pandemic economy? And more importantly, what is your top tip for building generational wealth? Yeah, I think, well, first off, when we're talking about building generational wealth, I think we need to talk about the direction that our overall economy is going in, and that is digital facing. So on top of the wealth gap that affects so many of us, especially women of color, there is also a technology gap. And we've seen time and time again, there are studies that come out that the black and brown communities are 10 years behind when it comes to technological skills, access to equipment. And that is the future of business. That is the future of wealth building. My business has been online since 2013. And it's still such a new space for so many of us. So I think understanding that need for us to become proficient in what is going to be the jobs of the future is paramount because then we're going to have access to those careers and that that money making uh those money making tools that are going to allow us to then build generational wealth and and it really to deeply understand the power of the purse when it comes to this community janice torres rodriguez thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate your expertise and still ahead, from business plans and the economy to the power of politics, the big push to sway the Latino vote, and why it's not a one message fits all type of conversation. Stay with us. I'm Morgan Radford, and we are back with a focus on politics. The Latino population in America makes up a huge voting block, and it's increasingly clear that politicians really cannot rely on a one-size-fits-all approach. So one example, just take a look at the Latino population growth since the 1970s. Back then, the population increases were split evenly between those who were born in the U.S. and those who were immigrants. But take a look at the bottom of your screen and the Latino population growth by births it has surpassed growth from immigration by quite a lot. So we're also seeing a shift in language. In the 1980s, more Latinos spoke Spanish at home than were proficient in English. But by 2019, more Latinos were proficient in English than those who were speaking Spanish at home. Both of those shifts, immigration status and language, can really impact political beliefs and where people choose to live. So look at some of just the fastest growing counties in terms of Latino population, places that saw its Latino population grow by more than 1,000. And you might be surprised. Look at Seward County, Kansas, Charlton County, Georgia, Nobles County, Minnesota. Growth in counties like those show that the Latino population spread all across the country, including in places where political campaigns really haven't targeted that vote historically in the past. So we want to get right to our panel now. We have actor Les Alonso, who is back with us. I'm also joined by former GOP Congressman Carlos Curvelo in Florida and political consultant Chuck Rocha, who directed Latino outreach for the Sanders campaign. You all, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Chuck, I want to go ahead and start with you because let's take a look back for a minute. Let's talk 2020. Biden won in three states with really strong Latino populations, but Democrats also lost some key congressional races. So what happened? I think what you saw is a coming together of a flawed system over time. You just showed how the population has changed, the demographic has changed, the way we consume media has changed, and our population as a whole. The average age of a Latino in America is only about 26 and a half, yet we still do politics when we're talking to Latinos the same old way. We show up late, we run a few ads on Univision or Telemundo, and then we check a box that we've done Latino outreach. Well, what the Republicans did last year in the last election was they took advantage of COVID when Latinos weren't out canvassing door to door and Democrats weren't out door to door. They were in those neighborhoods. They were running long, sustainable operations, right? And where Democrats came in too late with too little and with ads that weren't that culturally competent. 
So what we saw was Latinos who had already made up their mind. If I was to summarize this in one way, we have to treat Latino voters now as white persuadable voters. They can't be counted on as democratic based voters. They align ideologically more with the, the values of the Democratic Party. But if you're not there to remind them that or to tell them that, they're going to go to the lowest common denominator on what they are hearing and who is in their neighborhood. The bottom line is you have to show up. You have to show up early. You have to show up with respect and talk about the issues that the community is talking about. When you say white, persuadable voters, I, I imagine there are people who might take issue with that, especially given the discussion we just had about a lot of Afro-Latinos who probably are aligning with the Democratic Party if we are looking at the numbers in which Black Americans align with the Democratic Party. Uh, we know, for example, that Latino voters favor Democrats by a two-to-one margin overall, but we also know that Trump expanded his share of Latino voters between 2016 and the last election. So, one, Laz, I want to ask you if, if if you agree with sort of this notion of Latinos being treated as white, persuadable voters. And then, two, I'd like to ask, what do you think the Republican Party perhaps needs to do to carry that momentum into the midterms? Well, I, I don't know what either party has to do to carry any momentum into the midterms. Um, to be honest with you, for me, I think that uh, Latinos should be met where they are. Um, some Latinos have certain issues that mean more to them than others and vice versa. We can't just blanket all Latinos as one uh, monolith. Uh, I have issues that vary. You know, right now, my main issue is freedom of Cuba. That's my main issue that's taking up my political uh, mind space. And whoever on either party, Republican or Democrat, that is going to put their neck on the line and do whatever it takes to advocate for Patria Vida, for Cuba becoming free, that's who is going to win my vote. So I think that politicians need to understand where people are and meet them there. Carlos, I'd like to bring you in here because I want to go back to this notion when we look at 2020 and the fact that despite his immigration rhetoric, former President Trump did see a lot of support among the Latino communities. What does that say in terms of the upcoming midterms? What do we lessons do we learn? Was that simply a Trump phenomenon or is that something that the Republican Party can perhaps emphasize and try to court more of those Latino voters? Well, Morgan, I think that's a very important point. And it's a reminder that the Latino community, American Hispanics, are a diverse community. No todo el mundo piensa igual. Of course, immigration is important to a lot of Latinos, but I think especially Democrats and some Republicans over the last couple decades have assumed that that is the number one issue for every Latino household in this country. And that's just not the case. So Donald Trump, uh, some would say disingenuously, promoted a message of prosperity, of hope, of opportunity, especially during the pandemic, when a lot of Latinos wanted to work, they wanted their kids to be in school, and a lot of people in the community identified with that. We saw Trump make gains with uh, Latinos all over the country, but especially in South Florida and in South Texas. And that's another reminder that there are a lot of Latinos out there who do want border security. Uh, who oppose uh, illegal immigration. Uh, so this is important in understanding the community, that it's diverse. And you know what? That's OK. It's interesting you said that because it's taking me back to what Laz said earlier when he said, look, I'm Cuban and I care about who is going to liberate Cuba. I mean, to all of you here on the panel, is there any message that is a win among Latinos, no matter the party? Or is this community just as divided as the rest of the country? But what do you think Latinos want to hear going into the next midterms? Look, I will say it this way, is that you can look at this amazing panel. We all on paper or on the voter file as a Latino voter, when our issues could not be more different. But there are things that tie us together. I've been doing campaigns for 32 years. I'm the senior most operative in DC that's brown. And I will tell you that there are three things that ties us all together. That's the love of our family and wanting to protect our family and provide for our family, whether our family's here in Mexico or Cuba. The other two things that we rarely talk about is food and music. Our food and music ain't all the same, but we all love it with extreme pride. And when we talk about hope and optimism and making sure we can provide for our family, making sure there's economic opportunity, no matter what your country of origin is, that ties us together. And we've seen that work. The 
problem that Democrats have had is we went and showed up too late to tell them what we have done for them. And because when I mentioned white voters earlier, it's because we spent billions of dollars talking to suburban white people because there are the vote that everybody thinks we got to get while forgetting about black voters, assuming they're going to just show up for us anyway, and that Latinos all vote like Mexicans uh, who are in East L.A. who've been here for many generations. We have to have cultural nuances to make our politics more relevant to the time we're living in. You know, it's interesting because earlier we were talking about recent demonstrations, for example, in Cuba. But this is something that has also happened in other countries, in Venezuela, in Colombia. And, and, and we understand that there has been a politicization of those issues abroad here at home. So, for example, Laz, when you were talking about Cuba... Um, I've covered many a Trump rally, from Tulsa to Miami, and it's fascinating to watch the Trump rallies in Miami, where there are so many Latinos who are voting based on what's happening at home. But is there a way, for example, you think forward, for this community to talk about the repressive regimes at home without necessarily likening them or even perhaps demonizing certain parties here at home. How do you thread that line? It's a, it's a very, very uh, thin line to thread. Uh, if you look at most Latinos that are here, they immigrated here for a better life, for a better opportunity, or they were escaping some type of uh, violence or threat at home. You know, so the biggest thing I've noticed when it comes to a Latino here passionately supporting a party, whether it be the right or the left, is their fear that what happened at home will happen here. During July 11th, when things were happening in Cuba, people came to the White House to talk to Joe Biden. They didn't care that he wasn't a Republican president. He was Democrat, but that's who they needed to speak to. And that's who they were appealing for help from. Same thing with, with any congressman that would stand up for their cause and their issues. I think at the end of the day, people are people. And that's how you have to approach the subject. It, it's, it's easy to kind of put them in a stat sheet and say, this percentage votes this way, this percentage votes that way. But at the end of the day, why do they vote that way? And that's where the heart and the soul and the spirit of the person comes in. We have to remember that. Las Alonso, Carlos Curbello, Chuck Rocha, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and also your expertise. And that's it for our NBC News Now special on Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm Morgan Radford. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful rest of your life. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.